హాయ్ ఫ్రెండ్స్ ఇంటర్వ్యూస్ ప్రిపేర్ అవుతున్నా కానీ లేదా ఇంటర్వ్యూస్లో మనం చెప్పలేని క్వశ్చన్స్ ఏవైతే ఉంటాయో కొన్నిసార్లు ఆ స్పెసిఫిక్ క్వశ్చన్కి మనం గూగుల్లో సెర్చ్ చేసిన యూట్యూబ్లో సెర్చ్ చేసిన ఆ ఆన్సర్ తెచ్చుకోవడం అనేది కొంచెం కష్టం ఆ టాపిక్ రిలేటెడ్ వీడియో దొరకచ్చు ఆ టాపిక్ రిలేటెడ్ ఆర్టికల్ దొరకచ్చు బట్ ఆ స్పెసిఫిక్ క్వశ్చన్ ఏదైతే ఉందో దానికి మనం ఆన్సర్ తెచ్చుకోవడం కొంచెం కష్టం అనమాట సో ఈ వీడియోలోని ఈ ఏఐ టూల్స్ అనేవి మనం వాడుకొని ఎలా మన ఇంటర్వ్యూ ప్రిపరేషన్ అనేది కొంచెం ఫాస్ట్ గా చేసుకోవచ్చు ఎలా మనకి హెల్ప్ఫుల్ అవుతాయి చూడడానికి అయితే ట్రై చేద్దాం మన అందరికి తెలిసిందే చాలా ఏ టూల్స్ ఉన్నాయి వీ హ్ చాట్ జిపిటి వీ హ్ జెమిని అండ్ ఆల్ దీస్ థింగ్స్ రీసెంట్ గా ఏంటంటే ఇందులోని ఓన్లీ టెక్స్ట్ బేస్డ్ కమ్యూనికేషన్ కాకుండా కాన్వర్సేషనల్ బేస్డ్ కమ్యూనికేషన్ అయితే వచ్చింది అండ్ రీసెంట్ గా నేను ఇంటర్వ్యూస్ కి ప్రిపేర్ అయినప్పుడు కూడా దీన్ని చాలా ఎక్స్టెన్సివ్ గా గూగుల్ కన్నా ఎక్స్టెన్సివ్ గా వాడడం అయితే జరిగింది సో ఈ వీడియోలో కొన్ని క్వశ్చన్స్ ని అడిగి చూడడానికి అయితే ట్రై చేద్దాం సో మనం జెమిని ఏఐ వాడుకొని ఇది క్వశ్చన్స్ కి ఆన్సర్స్ ఎలా ఇస్తుంది మనం దాన్ని ఎలా క్వశ్చన్ చేయగలం మన ఇంటర్వ్యూ ప్రిపరేషన్ లో ఎలా వాడుకోగలం చూడడానికి అయితే ట్రై చేద్దాం సేమ్ టీచర్స్ ఆర్ అవైలబుల్ ఆల్సో ఇన్ చాట్ జీపీ ఆల్సో బట్ నేను ఇంటర్వ్యూ ప్రిపేర్ అయినప్పుడు జెమిని ఏ అనేది కొంచెం హెల్ప్ఫుల్ అనిపించింది సో మనకి రైట్ సైడ్ లాస్ట్ లో మనం ఈ స్క్రీన్ షాట్ లో చూసుకున్నట్టు రైట్ సైడ్ లాస్ట్ లో ఒక సింబల్ ఉంది ఈ సింబల్ ఏంటంటే మనకి ఈ కాన్వర్సేషన్ ని ట్రిగర్ చేయడానికి హెల్ప్ చేస్తుంది అనమాట సో ఇప్పుడు అది ఇనిషియేట్ చేసి అది ఏ విధంగా ఆన్సర్స్ ఇస్తుంది చూడడానికి అయితే ట్రై చేద్దాం హాయ్ జెమిని I would like to learn about Java and Spring Boot. Would you be able to help me with it? I can definitely help with that. Java and Spring Boot are powerful tools for building web applications. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I have a specific question. Can you explain me about completable futures and some methods which are commonly used in completable futures? All right. Let's dive into completable future. It's a powerful tool in Java for asynchronous programming. Basically, it lets you run tasks in the background and then do something with the results when they're ready. One of the most common methods is supply async. You give it a task and it runs it in a separate thread. When the task finishes, supply async gives you a completable future that holds the result. Another one is then apply. This lets you take the result of a completable future and transform it. Think of it like a chain reaction. One task finishes and its result gets passed to the next. There's also then compose, which is similar to then apply. Okay, okay, wait. When you want to so tell me, how can I handle exceptions in completable futures? Great question. Handling exceptions is crucial for robust code. In completable future, you typically use the exceptionally method. It allows you to provide a fallback value or perform some error handling logic if an exception occurs during the completable future's execution. If you'd like, I can give you some examples of how to use exceptionally to handle different types of exceptions. No, that's fine. Can you tell me the difference between thread future and completable future? Sure. Threads are the basic unit of execution in Java. You can think of them like individual workers that can run tasks concurrently. However, managing threads directly can be complex. Future is an interface that represents the result of an asynchronous computation. It provides a way to check if the computation is complete, wait for its completion, and retrieve the result. But it doesn't offer much flexibility for chaining or combining operations. Completable future, on the other hand, is a more powerful and flexible way to work with asynchronous tasks. It implements the future interface and provides a rich set of methods for composing, combining, and handling asynchronous computations. Okay. It also allows you to handle... Okay, that's fine. Let me ask you a few things about REST APIs. Can you tell me, how can we call a REST API with, from within the code? Sure, there are a few ways to do that. One common approach is using Java's built-in HTTP URL connection class. It lets you create connections, send requests, and receive responses. Another popular option is using libraries like OKHTTP OK or Retrofit, which simplify the process and offer more features. If you'd like, I can provide some code examples of how to okay. use these different methods. Tell me, methods. how can I call REST APIs within Spring Boot projects? Okay, so within Spring Boot projects, there are a couple of popular ways to call REST APIs. One common approach is using the REST template class. It's part of the Spring Web module and provides methods for making HTTP requests. Another option is the web client. which is a more modern and reactive way to handle http requests is okay. part of the spring That's web fine. so tell me one thing when i am constructing my url and when i am passing the query parameters what is the maximum length of this particular url what is the maximum length that a url can be of that's a good question the maximum length of a url can vary depending on the browser and server some older browsers had limits around 2000 characters but modern browsers and servers generally support much longer urls However, it's still a good practice to keep URLs reasonably short for better usability and to avoid potential issues with older systems. Okay, that's fine. So I have another question with respect to Spring Boot. So we all know Spring Boot comes with an internal Tomcat server, but I don't want to use Tomcat. I want to use a different server. So how can I do that? What exactly do I need to do? Sure. 
you can definitely use a different server with Spring Boot. To do this, you'll need to exclude the default Tomcat dependency and include the dependency for the server you want to use. Spring Boot supports several embedded servers, including Jetty and Undertow. Here's how you can do it. In your palm link to .xml file, you'll need to add an exclusion for Tomcat and then include the dependency for your desired server. For example, to use Jetty, you'd add the following to your palm link to .xml. XML. After making these changes, Spring Boot will use Jetty instead of Tomcat. Okay, that's fine. So let's jump into microservices. So can you explain me about the CQRS design pattern and in what scenarios do we need to use the CQRS design pattern? Okay, so CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. It's a design pattern that separates read and write operations for a data store. This can be really helpful in microservices architectures where you might have different teams or services responsible for reading and writing data. Imagine you have a product catalog. One service might handle updating product information, the right side while another service handles displaying product details to customers, the read side. CQRS lets you optimize each side independently. For example, you could use a different database or caching strategy for reads to make them super fast. CQRS is especially useful when you have complex business logic or high read slash write volumes. It can also improve security by limiting the scope of each service. Okay, so tell me one thing. In command, which REST API should I have? And in query, which REST API should I have? Great question. In the command side of CQRS, you'd typically have REST APIs for creating, updating, and deleting resources. These APIs would handle the write operations. On the query side, you'd have APIs for retrieving data, like getting a list of products or fetching details for a specific product. These APIs would handle the read operations. Okay, so tell me one thing. Uh, can you explain about the JEP290, the deserialization filter that was introduced in Java 9? Sure. JEP290, also known as the deserialization filter, was introduced in Java 9 to help prevent security vulnerabilities related to deserialization. It allows you to specify which classes can be deserialized, providing a way to block potentially dangerous classes from being loaded. This is important because deserialization can be exploited to execute arbitrary code. So tell me, where can I mention all these allowed classes? Is there any Java argument that I can use? Yes, you can specify allowed classes using the jdk.serialfilterJava argument. This argument takes a pattern that defines which classes are allowed or rejected during deserialization. You can use wildcards and regular expressions to create flexible filters. Okay, so tell me what are the different garbage collectors that are available in Java? Java has several garbage collectors, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. Some common ones include the serial garbage collector, which is good for single-threaded applications, and the parallel garbage collector, which is designed for multi-threaded applications. There's also the CMS garbage collector, which aims to minimize pause times, and the G1 garbage collector, which is a good all-around choice for many applications. More recently, Java introduced the Z garbage collector, which is designed for very low pause times, and the Shenandoah garbage collector, which also focuses on minimizing pauses. So can you tell me about the mark and sweep garbage collector? The mark and sweep garbage collector is one of the oldest garbage collection algorithms. It works in two phases the mark phase, where it identifies which objects are still in use, and the sweep phase, where it reclaims the memory occupied by unused objects. It's simple but can lead to fragmentation, where free memory is scattered and hard to allocate. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about the address transactional annotation and the isolation and the propagation levels that can be used? Sure. The at transactional annotation is used in Spring to manage database transactions. It ensures that a series of database operations are treated as a single unit, so either all operations succeed or none do. Isolation levels control how transactions interact with each other. Common levels include read underscore committed, which prevents dirty reads, and repeatable underscore read, which prevents non-repeatable reads. Propagation levels determine how transactions behave when methods call each other. For example, required creates a new transaction if one doesn't exist, while supports uses an existing transaction if available. Can you talk about the propagation levels? Propagation levels determine how transactions behave when methods call each other. Required creates a new transaction if one doesn't exist, while supports uses an existing transaction if available. Requires underscore new w always creates a new transaction, suspending the current one if necessary. Nested creates a nested transaction within the current one. Okay, so tell me, in at the rate transactional, what happens internally? Under the hood, at transactional uses Spring's AOP, aspect-oriented programming, to create a proxy around the method. This proxy intercepts the method call and starts a transaction before the method executes. If the method completes successfully, the transaction is committed. Otherwise, it's rolled back. 
Strings Platform Transaction Manager is responsible for managing the actual transaction. Okay, so can you tell me within the REST APIs, which REST APIs are idempotent and which of them are not? Okay, so in REST APIs, get requests are always idempotent. Put and delete requests are also idempotent, meaning that multiple identical requests have the same effect as a single request. Post requests, on the other hand, are generally not idempotent, as they can create new resources with each request. How about patch? Patch requests are a bit more nuanced. They can be idempotent if the patch document specifies the full replacement of a resource. However, if the patch document only specifies partial updates, then the request is not idempotent. Okay, so tell me one thing. My service is up, but my, but my database is down. So in this kind of a scenario, what is the response code that I have to give back? If your service is up but the database is down, you should return a 503 service unavailable status code. This indicates that your service is temporarily unable to handle the request due to a downstream dependency being unavailable. It's also a good practice to include a retry after header in the response, suggesting when the client might try again. Okay, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. I'm glad I could help. If you have any more questions about Java, Spring Boot, or anything else, feel free to ask. So, Adi friends, when I choose to type, it's like a conversation. Okay, well, either a text or question. I did that. It will be a paragraph. And it will be really difficult to read all those things. Ledu, ilaga, when I friend to talk like that too. It's like a, it's like a much better way. It's in a conversational way. So, mere gan interviews to prepare out that type. Coding kora is just that, but it's not in a conversational way. When a conversation is when I choose to, when I either type or when a conversation, I'm the code I'm the when print out that. But for theoretical things, if we want to learn in depth, every single question we can ask it, and 99 percent of the time. మనకి ఇంటర్వ్యూ లో అడిగే క్వశ్చన్స్ అన్ని కూడా ఇందులో కవర్ అయితే అవుతున్నాయి సో మనకి ఏదన్నా టాపిక్ తెలియకపోతే మాత్రం ద ఫస్ట్ థింగ్ టు డూ గూగుల్ లో కన్నా ఐ థింక్ ఇట్ ఇస్ లిటిల్ బిట్ బెటర్ హియర్ స్పెసిఫిక్ క్వశ్చన్ స్పెసిఫిక్ ఆన్సర్స్ అండ్ ఇట్ ఇస్ మచ్ మోర్ ఫాస్టర్ అండ్ ఈజియర్ టు లర్న్ ఈ వీడియో ఇన్ఫర్మేషన్ మీకు హెల్ప్ అనిపిస్తే వీడియో లైక్ చేయడానికి ట్రై చేయండి అండ్ ఛానల్ కి కొత్త